welcome to another episode of the Remy Podcast. I am Remy, as always. And I'm Lord Matthew. And he is Lord Matthew, as always, twice on Sunday. Is that... Sure. Yeah, why not? <laughs> um, we had a little bit of a layover because baseball news decided to be slow because, you know, we're a week away from spring training and your two megastar 26-year-old... Uh, Future Hall of Famers are still not signed anywhere, which does a great, great job for the sport. Oh, yeah. But, you know, that's what we're here, hopefully, to keep talking about. Uh, You know, we want to see somebody get signed. But, you know, January kind of wrapped up with some interesting West Coast trips for uh, Bryce Harper. He met, apparently, with the Padres and the Giants uh, in the recent weeks. Uh, John Heyman from MLB Network reported that the Padres are actually pretty serious about Harper. They they view him as a good business opportunity, as a marketing opportunity. Uh, they prefer him as a player over Manny Machado. And then the uh, the Giants have kind of been scouring for outfield assistance. They've been trying to get better and they've been trying to acquire uh, a decent outfielder as well. Uh, so Harper certainly uh, checks some boxes for the West Coast teams. And then Harper, obviously, a uh, Vegas native. Very, very true. <laughs> Matt, should I add anything? I you don't know. should add. I mean, that's why you're here, man. You're, you're here to add, not subtract. <laughs> um, I mean, it makes. I think it, the Padres, if they can pick one or the other, I would say Harper might be a better fit for him. Like you said, he's from that area. He, I think, would be a bigger draw than Machado. I think he's got the like. I think Machado overall might end up being a better player, but Harper has the name. He has the reputation for that I think he would you know kind of have the I don't know like the LeBron effect or something but like kind of bring other free agents or or more interest to the team because the Padres are one team that desperately needs that kind of attention and I feel like Machado having gone from the Orioles to a you know a winning team back to the Padres doesn't really make sense Harper's already been on the Nationals they're kind of on the they were on the downslope a little bit last year it sounds like they might be improving this year but I could see him more so than Machado going over to the Padres, if I had to pick one or the other. But then if you look at the Giants, and the Giants I could understand are looking for an outfielder. Hunter Pence, not quite what he was. Um, I think they view themselves as not necessarily right-handed heavy, but having another lefty power bat would be would be good, and especially in a position um, you know, like a corner outfield spot that they desperately need. But yeah, I love Madison Bumgarner. You know, he 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 he's still, in my opinion, an ace. What he's done in the playoffs has been amazing. But then you look at the rest of that rotation, and there's a little bit of question marks. Jeff Shamarge does not what Jeff Shamarge was. I cannot say his name, and if I had to say it three times, Just call fast, him Shark. That's what we call the him. Shark. The, the Shark. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot the the Cubby years. So the the Giants are an interesting story because they're not afraid to spend, as we've seen over the years. But my my question to you, I guess, would be. Does it make sense right now to move, have a big move like Harper? I know it's California, so splashy moves are kind of customary, but how close do you think, in your opinion, are the Giants to contention that would would Harper push them over the edge, or I, I still think there's too many holes in that uh, in that team? Well, it's an odd year, so obviously they're not going to do anything next year, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they Bumgarner was hurt a lot last year. I mean, he kind of had a down year for, by his standards. The rest of it, because Samarja has been in talks of being another team. I mean, their their rotation's kind of like you said, sort of a mess right now. Um, they have a lot of players that have been good in the past that are kind of aging a little bit. I mean, I don't know if I think Harper would more likely sign with the Giants because they're more, I guess, close to a team that could compete. But for how long, I don't know. The Padres have the I don't know if you call it a luxury, but the ability to build from the ground up so to speak and they have no problem signing these giant contracts to people so i mean i could i could see him going with the giants but it, it doesn't seem like you know his presence would be enough to push him over the edge unless everybody sort of returns to that you know that 2010 12 14 form or whatever yeah, that's not happening but you did uh you did create an interesting segue because the giant i guess pun intended the giant giant contracts have been coming into play in their outfield search uh, Buster Olney uh, hopefully prophetically claimed that the Giants might be interested in the Yankees' Jacoby Ellsbury on a bad contract swap. Again, looking for an outfielder, a lefty hitting outfielder. Um, I mean, Ellsbury's plagued by injuries. I don't really know what you're even going to get, but the Giants do have a whole host of bad contracts. Olney was suggesting 
Um, you know, maybe Johnny Cueto, he has $68 million left on a three-year deal. Um, I was looking at Samarja. He's got two years, $36 million left. Brandon Belt's got three years, $48 million. And Mark Melanson's got two years, $28 million. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that some combination or, or you know, Cueto plus, you know, dollars, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how they would end up wanting to work it, but there's, there is a lot that could be moved. Now, the question would be, you know, Ellsbury, and, and I'm not trying to trash a guy or anything, he's worthless on the Yankees. He, he's so low on the outfield depth. I mean, you, you have Judge, you have Hicks, you have Stanton, you have Gardner, you have Frazier, and I know some of that's a mixed bag. Frazier, you know, is getting healthy from concussions. Um, Gardner, you know, maybe a little bit uh, slowed down with the bat, but he is still a gold glove, in my opinion, left fielder. Um, Judge is an amazing outfielder for a guy his size to have the range and the speed and just uh, his arm is amazing. Uh, Aaron Hicks, I would argue, is probably a top five center fielder, and I'm not talking about offense. I mean, strictly defensively. Sure, sure. Um, I, I think he's had some of the um, – quickest throws from the outfield to the infield in the major leagues in the past few years so um, I don't think Ellsbury has a home on the Yankees anymore now with that said Johnny Cueto is still recovering from injuries um, so the Yankees could get uh, some insurance payouts for Cueto until he comes back which might be at the end of this year or you know the Yankees first base is kind of a question mark Uh, Greg Bird has not performed up to standards and people wonder if Luke Voigt's a one-hit wonder but uh, Belt's got some lefty pop. Um, y- you could maybe make the argument that a straight-up uh, Belt for Ellsbury swap would be good for both teams uh, as uh, positions of need, you, I guess you could say. I mean, there's a lot of combinations that work. Um, bad contract swaps are not unheard of. I mean, they're, they're a good way to get resources out of essentially nothing. Um, you know, how, how do you feel? What do you what do you think? Does that sound like it makes sense to you, or would you hold off and try and do something different versus just trying to move one man's trash to become another man's treasure, so to speak? Well, I feel like with with both those players, I mean, you mentioned Ellsbury and Belt. It's almost like just a change of scenery might just be better because, especially with Belt, I mean, the Giants Park is not a good lefty hitting park by any means, unless you're Barry Bonds. Um, he would probably flourish in New York, honestly. Uh, especially offensively. Ellsbury, you guys have a habit of taking like Boston center fielders and trying to, you know, reclaim that magic a little Damon bit. Damon did yeah, good for us. Though. Damon was Damon was a little bit better than Ellsbury, I'll say that. But um yeah, I mean with Ellsbury, he's been kind of on the downturn the last few years. I mean the Giants I feel like are not gonna want to give up much. I mean I guess you because you're giving up a big contract with him. I don't know how much the Giants are gonna want to give up for an aging, slowing down center fielder, even if they do have a need for it. Um, he'd be like the ultra consolation prize if they don't, you know, land Harper. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like you guys are kind of in more need of pitching, honestly, the starting pitching more so than the, like, hitting-wise. Your, your lineup's stacked even with, yeah, you know, so, Bird so and all that. That's why I guess Cueto was thrown out there. You know, Cueto's healthy to the end, of, you know, at the end of the year or maybe the beginning of uh, the following season. I mean, that's a bigger be- contract, too. It's like, was it 22-plus million a year versus 16 for Belt? Well, yeah, but I mean, Ellsbury's Ellsbury's old over the next two seasons, uh, approximately forty-eight. So Cueto's twenty million more. So the yeah, Giants would have to true, kick yeah, in yeah. money, or something would have to offset. Absolutely, but I mean, Ellsbury's the sunk cost. I mean, sure, I, I can't see a situation where he is, is on on the twenty-five man roster. You know, where he's sure. so I, well, especially I, with your team now. Yeah, you just eat money basically. No, so it's. It's interesting, and, and while we're on the topic of New York outfielders, I, I am looping it back to Harper briefly. You know, we've talked on, on the show a lot about Machado, possibly, you know, to the Yankees, that might be his preference. Uh, TMZ Sports, and I, and I know when you think, you know, hard-hitting journalism, you think TMZ Sports. Super reliable. <laughs> um, they caught up with Aaron Judge, and this video was going on online yesterday where they asked Judge about Harper, and Judge said when you, you know, you want to add players like of that caliber. And they said, you know, they both play right field. And Judge said he would change positions if Bryce Harper wanted to be a Yankee. I don't know how to tell Aaron this. I guarantee you Bryce Harper wants to be a Yankee, but the Yankees haven't had much interest in him. Um, from my perspective, I, I don't understand this this concept that, that Harper is blocked. Right now... I'm assuming it would be some kind of uh, platoon with Gardner 
and Frazier. Uh, no offense to either of them. I, I think Clint has a lot of potential. I like the guy a lot. And Brett Gardner's probably been one of my favorite Yankees for his entire tenure because of you know he's a gritty guy, great defense. Uh, he's not going to hit bomb after bomb, but you know he was a good he was a good hitter. I would not. I would not prevent myself from getting a generational talent like Bryce Harper for either of those two. You could put Harper in left field, or you could put Judge in left field. I mean, Judge Judge uh, has been a center fielder in the past. Harper has been a center fielder in the past. I, I just opinion. I think Judge has a little bit stronger of an arm, but. Uh, I, I don't think any of this preclu- precludes anything, and you know maybe it's well wishing on Judge's part, and you know obviously you want the best players to come to your team, but um, I, I see no reason why the Yankees shouldn't get a player like Harper, and I think Harper's left-handed bat would play better, you know, to what you were saying in regards to to Belt, mm-hmm. you know, big lefty pop in Yankee Stadium seems to be a great thing to me. Sure, and I think with you know, like you said, Har- if you can get a chance to get Harper. You're not, I mean, he's had some up and down years. That's something you don't casually pass on. If he's like, hey, I want to play for you guys, you'll probably make room somewhere for him to play, regardless of who you already have on the team. Um, the only person you might not replace him with is Mike Trout, but no one's getting Mike Trout for cheaper than Bryce Harper. So. <laughs> oh, and it's interesting that, you know, we're a week away from uh, pitchers and catchers reporting. Sure. And as we get closer to that, you got to wonder if if a Machado or if a Harper is going to, um, you know, take a different kind of contract to, to get, you know, to get with a team. You know, I, I don't know exactly what their demands are, and I honestly don't think anybody really knows what their demands are. I know they wanted to make a lot of money, um, but maybe you take shorter deals that are that you know have higher averages just to accommodate, you know. And maybe at a time like that, a team like the Yankees do jump on a Harper or do jump on a Machado. You know, everybody said with uh, the signing of, like, DJ LeMahieu and uh, Troy Tulowitzki that, yeah, the Yankees aren't going to look at Machado anymore or what have you. I think as the prices become uh, less prohibitive, and if they do drop, it's it's the Yankees. I've watched them my entire life. I've seen what they do. I know they're not George Steinbrenner's Yankees anymore. I know Hal's uh, far from the <laughs> tree, but... Uh, not that much, you know what I mean? No. Yeah. When you have star power and you know you have a juggernaut like the Yes Network, and you want to appease your season ticket holders, I, I, I can't see one of those names not going to New York if the prices drop. Well, I think with with both those players, I and mean, I think we touched on it last week a little, or I guess the last session two weeks <laughs> two, ago, two weeks whatever, ago, a week and a half ago. Um, the the longer term contracts, like guarantee is what they're trying to hope for. They're just they're just not prevalent anymore. You just don't see those seven, eight you know 10 year contracts i think that's what they're looking for and teams aren't biting on it anymore so either somebody's gonna have to blink at some point and i feel like the closer it gets to spring train the closer it gets to you know actual game time playing i think those numbers are going to shift a little bit and you'll see those shorter kind of more upfront contracts well look at look i mean we just mentioned jacoby ellsbury if you want to talk about recent yankee history about a long-term i mean he's not it wasn't a 10-year deal or something like that but They've, we've seen durability come into question. A-Rod's long-term contract weren't great. Seattle with Cano's long-term contract that, you know, what he wanted to stay in New York. Just the, the, the time and place, and I, and I know players will have a problem, but it is market correction. You know, these big mega deals handed out left and right. And that's not to say the players shouldn't get a fair share of money. You know, they're bringing in the fans. They're there to see them. They're there to... You know, help help teams make money with the jersey sales and whatever promotions and what have you, but it's still market correction. You, you you're not giving ten year deals. It's just not realistic. But um, you know, a player. I, I'm switching gears here just because you know we've talked about Machado, we've talked about Harper, but I feel like a player that we've talked almost just as much about uh, as those two, and who's not a free agent, ironically enough, has been J T. Realmuto. And Ken Rosenthal's been reporting that the the Phillies are back in looking at him, which is very interesting as a team that's sort of rebuilding, reloading, and you know back in competition. You know they had stupid money, which is why they've been looking at Machado and Harper and the like. So it's interesting to me to look at a arguable, well, not arguably, he is a big name. He's probably the best catcher overall in the league, as we've discussed ad nauseum. But it's interesting that the Phillies would uh, reengage with their uh, division rivals, the Marlins. Uh, and try and cook up something for Real Muto. 
I mean, again, another player that you would not want to casually just turn down either if the price is right for it. Um, I mean, the Phillies, they had obviously kind of a disappointing end of their season last year, but they're, I mean, they're, they were just one or two pieces away. They've already retooled for this year. I think they're going to be much better this year. Um, I mean, he could be enough to give them a more sturdy lineup, a more steady lineup. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised that they're doing that at all. I think, you know, the, the Marlins are sort of trying to get as much as they can at this point to try to retool their team right now and kind of, I think a lot of teams have, have kind of seen the templates done by, I mean, the Cubs are obviously the one I think of, but you look at the Braves and you look at the Red Sox, you know, stockpiling draft picks, um, stockpiling this young talent, and then just building up from there. And I think Astros. The Astros did the same thing. So I think the the Marlins are, I would hope, finally seeing the light in that sense and, and kind of going that route. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not surprised the Phillies are on. I think they're trying to get everybody they can to make a big push because the Braves are going to be tough again. Uh, the the NL East is going to be interesting division, and then then the Mets retooled with uh, with their new G- GM with the Brody bandwagon and uh, Rubens uh, homeboy. Oh yeah. Um, so it's it's interesting to see what's going on. Um, I do want to shift uh, things to another superstar player. Uh, hasn't happened uh, as of yet that I've seen, but um, the Rockies uh, owner president uh, Dick Manfort or Monfort, sorry. Um, was reported by uh, Thomas Harding of MLB.com as they're on the precipice of ex- extending Nolan Arenado. So, Jeremy, why are you randomly bringing up a possible extension? Uh, as many of you know, and what we did five minutes ago, we talked about Manny Machado. So, what's the point? Well, on the previous show, we did mention that you know it's possible that teams are holding out instead of interest in Manny because they would like to maybe have a crack at Nolan Arenado either at the trade deadline or you know, next season when he's a free agent. So if Arenado's holding Pat in Colorado, does that change the market a little bit? And obviously, um, we won't know for the next couple of days, but I'm just speaking on my, uh, on my front, I guess I would say. With the, you know, if I'm the Yankees and I'm not gonna get Nolan Arenado, and I know that uh, Manny Machado wants to play for me, and that's going to be the only other premium third baseman. And I love Miguel Andujar. Don't ever think that when I talk about, you know, the Yankees getting a third baseman or whatever, that means, oh, Jeremy wants to dump uh, Andujar. No, and- Andujar is super young, extremely offensively talented, but the defense isn't there. And we don't know if the defense is going to be there. So you have another young, super talented, proven star in Manny Machado. If maybe you move Andrew Hart to first, maybe you just DH Andrew Hart. Whatever the case, it, it makes sense to me then to to not wait. You know the the whole year or maybe two hundred some odd days till the trade deadline or whatever that is, and you know act now for for what you can get. You know planning for the future can kind of be a tricky business in baseball. Oh, very sure, very 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 true. Um, Arenado, I think is probably the best I mean I love Chris Bryant but I think Arenado might be a slightly better third baseman in the National League because if you don't count Machado in his short tenure with the Dodgers but <laughs> and um, I don't <laughs> um, yeah if, if Arenado is going to re-sign with the Rockies that's one less quality third base that's going to be in the market next year um, I think you, you really just can't pass I mean I, I of Machado and Harper I still think Harper might be a better overall pick and he'll bring in more fans and more money and whatever you want to call it um but Machado is one of the best third basemen in the league and Arenado is you know doesn't have the name recognition but he's still probably up to par I would say with him on that um if he's gone then yeah if if you have the option to get Machado I'd say do it yeah I can't uh I can't disagree with you I didn't disagree with you there you go Uh, (laughs) We wanted to wrap up today with something that was coming out um, about the propose. And the, when we say propose, I know we, I think we talked about this actually in the first show. Some of the things that have been discussed, but proposed rule changes uh, for Major League Baseball, um, the MLBPA, and the Commissioner's Office, and everybody will kind of discuss what's going to happen. But uh, some of these were interesting. Some of these were a given, or things that you know Matt and I have uh, word vomited on consistently, like. Uh, should the DH be in the National League? It will eventually. People can stop crying about it. It will happen. Yeah. But um, Matt's gonna kind of take charge. And what what are some of the what are some of these things you were seeing, Matt? All right. So there's kind of a laundry list, and they went into a little bit of detail as far as 
why these might take effect. I mean, most of them are to try to speed up the game. I think Manfred's still in that, like, let's make the games less than three hours kind of thing. I mean, the intentional walk thing didn't really save, what, three seconds or whatever? It's valuable three seconds. Um, so first one that's kind of throwing the union already into loop is the three batter minimum, which I guess is going to be the, the way I was seeing is that it was going to be delayed until possibly 2020. But basically, for uh, relief pitchers? For relief, for relief pitchers. So there'd be a three batter minimum for any relief pitcher, barring an injury or if it's the end of an inning. So if they close the inning with one out, then that's they're out, they can come out the next inning. But if you come in, you know, the middle of the inning, you have to pitch at least three batters if the game's still going on. Your um, loogies would hate that. That is the exact thing I was going to think of. Is your your left out, your lefty one out guys. <laughs> um, that kind of eliminates that sort of tactic a little bit. And I think, I mean, the big reason for it is to prevent, you know, improve the game time and all that. You're not having all these pitching switches or, um, you know, mound visits or whatever you want to call it. But um, obviously, there's a lot of teams probably looking at that very closely because that's going to affect their strategies with any, you know, pitching management and all that. Do you do you like that? I think that's part of the game, honestly. I mean, you're not going to the game expecting a quick game, typically. <laughs> you're you're not, but I, I'm not trying to be contrarian to you, but I like that rule because we're, we're I mean, baseball, baseball, even though, you know, purists will say the game doesn't change, the rules don't change, it, it honestly does because if you look to where we were even 25 years ago, sure. you had starting pitchers going into the 6th, 7th, 8th. I mean, we, we used to have pitchers pitch an entirety of a game. You know, maybe you'd have one or two relievers as time went on, but now it's just, all right, my starter went four and a half or five innings, and here we go. Yep. It, it, if you're a pitcher in Major League Baseball, and I don't mean just a starter, I mean a reliever, and closers more specialized, I get it, but you got to be able to pitch, and these one-out only pitchers, and I'm not saying it's not a valuable skill set, because it is to, to have a matchup and be able to know that a guy's automatic. I get that. I, I don't have a problem with this. I don't like seeing 900 mound visits, and I, I'm somebody who doesn't care about the length of a game. I'll watch a two-hour game. I'll watch a three-hour game. I'll watch an 18-inning classic if I have to, whatever it is. Baseball is a leisure sport. I don't complain about having leisure time. Um, so I I do like that rule. I, I, I do think get them in there, take away the 900 mound visits to have to keep changing in and out pitchers, and pitch to the pitch to the freaking batters, man. <laughs> um, well, leading into that as a way to speed up the game, one of the other proposed rules was the 20-second pitch clock, which I know they've talked about previously, and the thing with that is that the again I was reading between you know the baseball union pushing back a little bit on Manfred, um, but there's nothing in the current contract that says he can't implement that. So he could do that as soon as this year without any pushback, without any sort of red tape to go through. Um, I think that would have a more universal effect on the overall speed of the game, even with those pitching changes, if pitchers are actually pitching in a timely fashion. Because I think a lot of it is you know, waiting around, trying to get your signals right and all that. I think that, that really slows the game down quite a bit. Well, I agree with you. I, I definitely think there's a lot of pitchers that need to speed up. I mean, as much as I love watching uh, Craig Kimbrell adjust his uh, chicken hook arm thing going on <laughs> for an hour and a half now, um, but, but there's definitely some pitchers that, that uh, take well and above the amount of time it should take to pitch. Um, yeah, I, I would be in favor of that. Um, they also touched on the DH in the National League. They said as soon as this year, even good. Um, which you know, in this in the league that is very focused on offense these days, that would be a big you know boost to the National League for sure. Um, and then everything else sort of stems on kind of kind of like team management a little bit. So they were proposing doing a single trade deadline, which I know is going to upset you because I know you love your transactions and all that. I love my transactions, but I don't have a problem with a single trade deadline. I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't have uh, any problem with them making it more concise. And then obviously you wouldn't have these like wonky rules where, you know, if it's after the trade deadline, the, the, the um, my brain is blanking, which is wonderful. But the... <laughs> You know the the, the uh, September trades where you know the guy can't appear on the playoff roster. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You like wave up. You know, I can't remember all the the non tender trade yeah, deadline yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, and then I this was more of a apparently a kind of compromise to the speed increasing tactics for the game. Uh, but they were thinking of increasing the overall roster to twenty six instead of twenty five with a twelve pitcher maximum roster, so adding thirty more players to the league. 
I like that actually. Uh, it's flexibility and also a lot of actually it screws with the Yankees because the Yankees typically carry 13 pitchers. <laughs> um, but that again goes into not having to have 900 pitching changes too. Sure. Even granted, that's one down. Um, I think that's probably done to you know if you're going to um, if you're going to not have as many. Um, September roster uh, roster call ups and things like that to have sure. a twenty six man roster is um, I think kind of a compromise. I think what they don't mention here also, um, or I didn't write that down, but the September roster because I think it's what 40, 40 men in September, right? Yeah, you can call it. That'll later. shrink down to actually thirty uh, with this new rule, so it's actually a smaller September roster. Oh, so you can't uh, you can't have you can't have like your your entire minor league team come in and and like you know, play out the season or something like that. Oh, I love that. No, I'm kidding, I don't. <laughs> I mean, for, for I, I think for, like, you know, rebuilding teams, that probably sucks because then you don't get to see all those young players come in toward the end of the year. Well, I mean, it's 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 kind of rough, too, because then the one thing I can see the MLBPA not loving is then you don't get some service time for some of those guys. But I guess that's also why you're expanding the 26-man roster to kind of make up for that so you can get extra, extra players uh, in the league. Sure. Um, I think that... A, a, affect some of the like uh was it like veterinary time whatever that term is called um just like mlb experience or whatever that's going to affect your your yeah the service time that's service time about. that's what i was trying to think of yeah um and then one that's directly related to kyler murray that we're oh talking we're about. talking about i love when things are, are, are prophetic um they are specifically related to him <laughs> Proposing that two sport amateurs can sign a full major league contract to entice them to play baseball as opposed to the other sport. I I well, I didn't tell you. It was just kind of my like opinion that I thought that you know that would that would be good for baseball. Yeah. So that's funny that that's something being yeah, discussed. I, was, I, I like saw that. that. I laughed. We were talking about that two weeks ago. Um, and then the final one I want to mention because it's it's kind of an interesting one because it could affect how teams perform during the season. Uh, is our draft incentives. And so their thought process is that teams that do win more are, I guess, middling teams. You think of teams like, I don't know, the teams that hover around 500 but never quite make that push over the edge. Uh, they actually get, like, extra better draft positioning and better draft incentives for doing conse- consecutively, having consecutively good seasons as opposed to teams that have consecutive 90 loss seasons, teams that, you know, maybe tank for draft picks. They actually get penalized for consecutive losing or seasons. money hoarders like the not like the Marlins had been maybe in the past sure. or the Pirates had been in the past or. and it could be a re- direct to the the owners of the Marlins who kind of screwed their fans over a little bit there but um, yeah I guess you know winning teams have better draft incentives losing teams have fewer draft incentives the longer that persists that that is interesting and I I I like it because it helps it helps create a, a sense of urgency uh, to win but I can also see where if you're like constantly a crappy team and not maybe purposely trying to be a crappy team, sure, that that maybe shoots you in the foot a little bit. I I, I don't know. I would I would need to ponder on that a bit more. Yeah, that was the only one I was kind of questioning because you you think of you know all these rebuilding teams. I mean, the Cubs had those you know three or four years where they were well, they've had a lot of years where they were terrible. But the years before they won the World Series, they were pretty bad, and we developed we got a lot of draft picks, a lot of good players from those drafts as a result of that. So this might change how teams approach rebuilding teams and they, maybe they do more you know free agent transactions like I don't know how you would work around that I guess I really don't know that's that, that's an interesting one I, I I don't foresee that flying as structured but we'll hey we'll see yeah. you never know that's why they're proposed rule changes <laughs> always the prepositions that's not at all what I was trying that, to say close enough yeah you know why, why not but uh, that kind of wraps us up for this week. So hopefully when we're back next week, we'll, we'll know where in the world is Manny Machado and Bryce Harper. Maybe uh, JT Romuto will finally be traded to the one of a billion teams interested in him. Uh, shoot, maybe all three of them just go to Japan. Just sign, sign with the uh, Nippon Ham Fighters. Let's do that. They have a pretty sweet team, then. Yeah, they would. That would get the uh, that would get the butts in the seats. Although I think I think baseball does pretty well over they're, there. They're, they make a lot of money over there. Yeah, they do. <laughs> but uh, hey, we'll see how everything shakes out. Thank you again for joining us, and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, have some placements of these uh, of these star players the next time that uh, we pick up this mic. Pitchers and catchers. Pitchers and catchers. Very soon. Can't Except wait. One week. Yep. I cannot. No, I really cannot wait. 
Uh, what? Something else to talk about. Something else to talk about, and, bu- and business will pick up, as they say. So uh, from Matt and myself, we thank you for listening, and always be a fan.